2013, am I right, Sarah? Yay, 2013 Atheist of the Year. Sarah Moorhead is a dear friend. She is the executive director of Recovering from Religion. Um, we've heard a lot this weekend about the harm of religion, how hard it is to leave, why it is essential that people do take on reason and take on understanding and leave superstition behind. The thing, though, is how do you do that? Where are the resources? What if you really just have never thought any other way and you don't know where to go? My friend here is going to help us answer that question. That's what she does as executive director of Recovering from Religion. And um, you heard Teresa McBain talk about the hotline project that helps people to know that they're not alone and talk through some of the questions. But um, let us be enlightened and let us understand that there is more that we can actually do to make a difference. My friend and, and yours, if she's not already, Sarah Moorhead. Okay. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yeah. Woohoo! All right. End of the day, we've got a good turnout. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. All righty. So I'm Sarah Moorhead, the Executive Director of Recovering from Religion. How many people here, show of hands, at one point in your life, you were religious? Whoa! That's pretty common. All right, now show of hands. How many people, when you were religious, considered yourself inerrant word, fundamentalist, um, Bible-believing, all of those things? Raise your hand. <laughs> no, we're not going to wave back and forth, I promise. That's too triggering for everybody. That wouldn't be very kind. All right, so I'm up here to talk to you about the Hotline Project. Recovering from Religion does a lot of things. We have several different programs. Um, one of them is that we have local groups that meet monthly uh, all over the country. They're expanding worldwide. We're very excited about those. We have the Secular Therapist Project, which is um, a program that matches secular therapists, which is therapists who agree to follow um, non-religious methodology, which most of us call that therapy, but there are segments of the population who actually infuse religion into their therapeutic practice. So we match secular therapists with people who are seeking out someone they can count on and trust is not going to infuse religion, either their former religion or the therapist's religion, into their uh, mental health care. So those are both exciting programs. They're doing very well. But what I'm really excited to talk to you about is the Hotline Project. The Hotline Project came about um, two years ago. We realized we were being inundated with emails and phone calls, people reaching out, telling us their stories. A lot of times they just need to talk. They don't have anyone in their community that they can reach out to, that they're able to connect with and say, hey, I'm, I'm going through this and I'm not really sure what to do or where to turn. They don't really understand all the different terminologies that we use, so they might be aware of the word secular, but that means Satan. They might be aware of the word humanist, but that means hell. They might not really think to look up free thought or non-believer or any of the many other terms that we use. So these people feel alone. They feel isolated. They don't have anywhere to turn. And as they were hearing about us, we were, they were reaching out and contacting us on our office line, um, by mail, we would get letters, very thick letters of just pages and pages, email, all of that. And we realized there was a need for a phone line that could be staffed with trained volunteers to answer these calls and be there as a resource, as a friendly ear, as people are going through this process. Now, one of the things that's very important to us at Recovering from Religion is what we call conscience over creeds. Now, what that basically means, people, as they're progressing through dealing with their questions, addressing their doubts, maybe they've already even left religion, and they're still just dealing with the influence of religion in their life, with their family, their coworkers, their friends. These people are doing what we call weighing their conscience versus their creeds. Creeds are your background, your religious belief system, um, your religious foundation, any of those things. And what we've seen happens is, 
they start to, there comes a tipping point where their conscience, they start to evaluate their creeds and realize their morality has started to surpass their religious views. They start to have situations where they see around them maybe they're gay or someone they love is gay, and they go, you know, I actually don't have a problem with this, but my religious views do. I don't really know what to do with that. For the people who choose conscience over creeds, they're starting the process of walking their way out of religion. They're deciding their morality makes more sense than that book. And that's something that we encourage. One of the things that's important to get across to everyone, whether they're in the religious communities or in the secular communities, is that the process of going from theism to atheism is not linear. There's agnostic theist, or I'm sorry, <laughs> there's agnostic theist and gnostic theist. There's agnostic atheist and gnostic atheist. And there's this entire spectrum that we've developed, and it's on our website called the Spectrum of Disbelief, that helps people understand where they are at in this entire process. And people bounce around. People will come to us and say, well, this is what I believe. This is what I believed a few years ago. I'm not really sure what's going on, but I'm constantly evaluating and learning about this. And we see them move along this progress where they start to kind of loosen their, their creedal beliefs and, and reconcile that conscience versus creed like we were talking about. And as they're progressing along, what we do is encourage them to get to a place that they are the most comfortable. They feel respected, they feel valued for who they are as an individual. And that's something that a lot of inerrant word fundamentalist religions, and even some of the more liberal ones um, that just aren't quite as cult-like, um, but those, you know, when religion says this is who you are, this is what you will think, this is what you will believe, they are defining you. What we want to do is encourage people to figure out who they are outside of that system. So for our hotline agents, they're all volunteers. It's a wonderful team of people. We have about 100 volunteers right now. We call them agents. And they go through a training process. Our hotline program is based on peer-to-peer -peer support. This means that they are not offering therapy. They are not giving answers or advice. What they're doing is being a friendly ear and providing resources. Those resources are crucial. When you've grown up your entire life being told what to think, what to believe, and that every answer is found in this one book, it can be really challenging to figure out where to go from there to learn more. So they will call us, and our agents are trained on how to walk them through this process. They go through a two-hour live training program um, we have them on live calls, or we have them on test calls, then they go on to live calls. Um, they're vetted through an extensive interview process that, you know, asks them all kinds of questions that may not seem relevant to you when you apply, but they make a lot of sense to us. And we're working really hard to ensure that the people on our phone lines are best equipped to address these calls. One of the things in our training that we address very, very strongly, first and foremost, is what's called Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, I won't get into all the details of it. However, the bottom two areas, the safety and the physiological, are the most crucial to any individual's stability. If people are calling into our hotline and those two areas are a problem, we are not a crisis hotline and our agents are trained to risk them out and immediately transfer them to a crisis hotline appropriate to their needs. This is crucial. It, they're reaching out to us for help. We want to help them, and we encourage them to call us back. But if they are suicidal, if they're in an active domestic violence situation, if they've been raped, there are hotlines out there who are completely trained and fully equipped, and we do not want to reinvent the wheel. So what we're doing is basically a clearinghouse at that point of where's the most appropriate place for them to be able to get the help they need, and then we encourage them to give us a call, black, call back. One of the most Common questions that we get. <laughs> what about the trolls? I'm assuming everyone here has heard of the internet. <laughs> so big surprise, when we announced that we were putting the hotline together, there was um, a gentleman who actually wrote a blog article, and he encouraged, as soon as they get that hotline up, we're going to inundate them with phone calls, we're going to tie up the lines, we're going to you know, infiltrate their system, we're going to do all of this stuff, whatever. Our agents 
are trained specifically on dealing with trolls. That's an entire component of our training. Now, there are some people, has anyone here worked call centers before? Raise your hand. There we go, yeah, quite a few. So one of the things in call centers a lot of times happens is they will say you have to go through this particular process to deal with an abusive or harassing caller. You have to stay on the line this amount of time. You have to use this particular phrase, these kinds of things. For us, boundaries are incredibly important and our agents are volunteers. This is their free time. We want them to feel respected. If someone's calling in and being a jerk, guess what? The phone call's over. That's okay. We want to empower everyone to be treated with respect. Everyone has the right to do that. Another way that people will call in is to debate. They want to call in because they are convinced we are the atheist deconversion hotline. Now, a lot of people, when given the appropriate support and necessary resources as they're questioning their belief system, do end up atheists. That's true. It just happens. It's not really our fault, we're just giving them the resources. When they call in to debate and argue, the first thing we do is have the agent take control of the call, redirect, and get them resources of where they can go to appropriately have that conversation because it is not us. We are not debating, we are not arguing, we are not trying to convince you of anything, and we don't really care if you want to convince us. We're good. So we'll give them a resource, we'll send them Say to Matt Delahunty. Everybody here know him a little bit? <laughs> I think somebody, yeah, I, I think we've heard of him a little bit. But we'll send him over to the, we'll send a caller over to the atheist experience because you know what? There are people out there better equipped than us to deal with those arguments. And, and if that's what they need to do, sometimes there are people questioning their belief system and they really are in a place that they need to argue it out. They need to deal with these questions. They need to be confrontational. And that's fine. They're just not going to do it on our hotline. So why are people calling? One of the reasons that people reach out to us very, very commonly, they no longer believe in God, they no longer believe in the supernatural, but they are terrified of hell. Anyone here experience that? When you left religion? Lots of hands, there we go. Because the belief system of religion, of eternal punishment, is drilled into your head from the earliest ages of your memory, it becomes such an integral part of your existence that even after you've logically walked your way out of the faith system, you can still be inundated with this paralyzing fear. It's just very common. So we will help people through that. Again, resources, links, books, all kinds of ways that they can connect. We will help them find support groups in their area. We try to connect them to a recovering from religion group. If there isn't one in their area, then we find other groups that are. And we say, hey, you know what? Check these guys out. They're going to be able to help you. They're going to be friendly to your questions. The other thing that we really encourage is boundaries. A lot of times people will call in and they'll say, here's the problem I'm dealing with, but I can't do all of these things that are being suggested. That's a tough situation to be in, to feel paralyzed by you know, lack of choice. So what we encourage at that point is for the agent to work with them on an action plan. What can we do? How can we support you? What steps can you take? And by putting it in that way, we're empowering that caller for the first time in their life many, many times. We're empowering them to start making decisions in their life to take control of their journey away from faith. So that's a brief overview of who we are and what we're doing. So I want you to hear for a few minutes from the voices of the people who are calling. I would love to give you audio. I can't do that because we've promised everyone anonymity when they call and we're very strict to maintain that. Until we have the software or whatever, I'm not a technical person, please understand that. But until we have whatever system we need to have to be able to anonymize the voices and blur out names and all those things, we're not gonna be able to provide any audio. But what I can do is show you guys some transcripts. I've been so careful about hiding secular stuff from my dad, but he saw my Dawkins book today. He preached at me for hours and I've had panic attacks ever since. While he was talking, I kept tracing words like love, logic, and RR on my arm. I didn't feel so alone and it distracted me a little. Big one. I've been an atheist for six months. 
My wife is upset. Our priest bugs her about why I'm not at church. He says, if I don't believe anything, I can't be a good dad to my son. And you can hear in the audio, he's starting to cry. I'm getting scared. She's starting to believe him. It's horrifying. Everyone at church looks down on me. I feel so alone. I'm still the same person. I just don't think what they're doing is right anymore. I'm still me. Why can't they see that? I don't know what to do. I think my husband knows I'm questioning all of this. He'll make me leave if he finds out. I can't lose my kids, but I don't know how long I can keep this up. This is a caller who, by the way, was not a non-believer at all. She identified as a Mormon. And we get that a lot. People, people are calling in all over the place with religion. They're calling in as believers, and they just have questions. They just have doubts. They'll call in as concerned family members. They'll say, well, you know, I, have a, I have a spouse or I have a brother who's going through this disbelief thing, and he watched that atheism CNN thing, and what's going on, and I don't know what to do, and we're able to reassure them and give them some resources. One really exciting thing about the hotline that I'm, and this is just me going on a nerd moment for a second, every single time they call in, we have um, anonymous demographics that we collect from the call. And they'll self-identify where do they fit in their religious belief system. And when they call multiple times, the way our system is set up, they, um, the system can recognize a repeat caller. We can't see it, it's all anonymized. But the system knows if they've called, if they've called before. So, what we're so excited about is that over 12 months, 18 months, we're gonna be able to actually quantify how long does it take for this caller, any of these callers, these thousands of callers, when they're calling in multiple times and they start off at this point, they identify as monotheist. And then they, when they get to a point they're happy and they're comfortable and they feel safe, maybe they're deist at that point and they go, you know, I'm good. I'm okay where I'm at. I don't, I'm not afraid of hell if I don't write a check to my church anymore. I'm good. How long is that going to take? What resources did they need during that process? How many times did they have to call and how frequently was it? Were there resources they needed that our secular community couldn't offer them? We will be able to answer those questions with this hotline. It's incredibly exciting. I'm 16, is it okay to talk to you? Our agents were very reassuring. I'm so scared of going to hell. I have nightmares that I'm on fire. My dad says that is God warning me. I don't think it's God though, is that bad? I don't believe in his God anymore. This caller, by the way, also did not identify as a non-believer. Like, when I was a kid, I loved my Legos. I didn't even make them, but I loved them, so I took care of them, you know? But the hell stuff, that's pretty bad. 16 years old, and he's wrestling with this. He was able to call us, and he was able to get the support he needed. Last one. This one was tough. Our agent that took the call had to take some time off the line and work with our supervisors to be emotionally okay to get back on the lines again. My parents said they won't let anyone in their house who doesn't accept Christ, even if it's their own kid. They don't know. And then she started crying some more. And I might too, so bear with me. I want to tell them, I have to tell them, they'll still love me, won't they? I'm so scared, I don't know what to do. The agent says, I'm here to help. How old are you? You could tell from the voice. 12. I'm 12. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we need the Hotline Project. I'll be outside if you have any questions. Thank you for your support.